world is aware that the Soviet Union demobilized. The American people are going to have to choose between the Bill of Rights and the Thomas Committee. They cannot have both. One or the other must be abolished in the immediate future. The time was 1949, only four years after World War II. With Japan's surrender and the end of the Nazis' rule, a new threat emerged, the atomic bomb. Tensions grew in the air, as a threat of nuclear annihilation upon the United States grew by the second. People feared to lose their jobs, countries divided in half, and communist rule was covering the globe. But as time ticks down by the second, so does the patience of the American people, and the workers in the film industry. This is the story about 10 people who stood by their American rights and continued to stand by the First Amendment of free speech. In this episode of Film History Digests, we're going to be going over the effects of the Cold War in cinema. In the past, the Cold War wasn't as kind towards the film industry unlike the past wars. In World War II, Walt Disney Studios in Burbank, California was actually where the houses of over 500 military soldiers were after the attacks on Pearl Harbor in 1941. Walt Disney Studios was known to be the only film studio under military occupation in history. With the emerging fear that swept over the country in World War II, nobody knew what would happen. So in an effort to cheer up the nation, we began to see a surplus of Disney cartoons be applied as a part of a propaganda movement. Almost a decade later, the Cold War's effect would not only tarnish movie studios' respect with the military, but also create a climate where the movie industry was scared to interact with them. To understand this topic, you would need to understand three topics. McCarthyism, the effect of the Cold War in America, and the blacklistings. As many of you already recognize the Cold War, it's more crucial to describe the effects of McCarthyism, and why it plays such an important role in this part of history. As some media has come to show, like with Season 3 of Stranger Things or Indiana Jones 4, Russians were a huge scare of our past. Though Stranger Things is a fictitious sci-fi television show, the idea of the secret Russian spies infiltrating the states was a real fear for the time. In the 1940s, the United States did house a very small but active communist party. During World War II, there were American communists who spied on Hitler. During the escalation of the Cold War, however, communism became seen as a much greater threat to national security. This is what was seen as the embodiment of McCarthyism. Joseph McCarthy, with whom it was named after, was the largest contributor to these scares, stating that he believed that 205 communists had infiltrated the US State Department. A lot of the fears of McCarthyism arose from the leaks of the top secret Manhattan Project, originally so top secret that Harry S. Truman didn't know about it. Truman was vice president during FDR's run in office, and president after his eventual passing. The Manhattan Project was the government's testing of the atom bomb, which eventually fell into the hands of the Soviets. Klaus Fuchs, the most popular of the Soviet spies, is the person responsible for supplying the Soviet Union with the powers to make the Cold War hot. Though the Soviet Union was already working on atomic fusion, Fuchs saved the Soviet Union two to three years of independent atomic engineering. With all that in place, it led to the eventual invasion of Hollywood. With the idea of McCarthyism running rampant throughout the nation, it started to become clear that the film industry was its next target. The House of Un-American Activities Committee, or the HUAC, released a report which claimed that communism was prevalent in the film industry. Two years later, former Communist Party member John L. Leach ended up naming 42 communist members lying low in the film industry. 
The reason why this was becoming such a prevalent issue at the time was out of fear that the communists working in the industry would brainwash negative ideologies across the nation through film. After Leach testified in front of the Los Angeles grand jury, the names of these government insiders were leaked to the public, which had then head chairman of the House of Un-American Activities Committee, Martin Dyes Jr., state he would clear under certain conditions. Out of the several accused were Frederick March, a well-respected actor who won two Academy Awards for his work in 1931's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and 1946's The Best Years of Our Lives. James Cagney, who won an Academy Award for his work in 1943's Yankee Doodle Dandy and was honored by the legendary director Stanley Kubrick while also being inducted in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Humphrey Bogart, who won an Academy Award for his work in 1951's The African Queen and was also inducted in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Katherine Hepburn, who actually holds the distinction of winning the most Academy Awards for acting with her work in 1934's Morning Glory, 1963's Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, 1969's The Lion in Winter, and 1982's On Golden Pond with 12 other nominations. There were other well-known Hollywood figures who were a part of this list, but these were some of the notable ones. It is also fair to note that not only were these Academy Award winning, well-respected Hollywood insiders being accused of communist activities, but the majority of them had actually spent time serving in the military. As long as these actors cooperated with Dyes by meeting with him, they would be free to go. It's fair to point out that there were other communists found in the film industry, but not much came from it. The most notable subpoena from the House of Un-American Activities Committee, however, which is the most synonymous with the blacklistings, is known as the Hollywood Ten. In 1947, there were 79 individuals that were subpoenaed on suspicion of communist propaganda in their films. There were more screenwriters, producers, and directors this time, rather than actors, as previously mentioned before. The Hollywood Ten are simply ten Hollywood figures that refuse to testify to the committee about their political beliefs, citing the First Amendment. Though there were actually 19 who refused to cooperate, the other nine were unable to appear in front of the committee. The remaining ten were eventually tried and were found guilty, which they appealed to higher courts with no avail. All ten were sent to federal prison and were scheduled to spend a year-long sentence. The Hollywood Ten included the likes of notable screenwriters, film producers, and directors. Starting with Adam Scott, producer and screenwriter, he wrote for the films Keeping Company in 1940, We Go Fast in 1941, The Parson of Panament in 1941, and his biggest hit, 1943's Mr. Lucky. There was also Albert Maltz, a novelist, playwright, a short story writer, and a screenplay writer. He's had his films distributed to the military, who gave them notoriety and also screened some of his films. Alva Bessi, a member of the International Brigades, and fought in the Spanish Civil War and World War II. He wrote novels about his time in the war and was contracted by Warner Bros. to write movies for them. One movie he made independently was, notably, Hollywood on Trial, which was nominated for an Academy Award in the category of Best Documentary Feature. Dalton Trumbo, a novelist and screenwriter, ended up writing for films under a pseudonym after his blacklistings. He even ended up winning two Academy Awards under this name. In the 1960s, his films, Exodus and Spartacus, were the first films he was credited with after the Hollywood blacklistings. This is usually marked as the time that Trumbo and other screenwriters were taken off the blacklist. At this time, the Writers Guild of America recognized all his achievements, which ended up covering over six decades of work. Edward Dimitrik was one of the only people in Hollywood 10 who primarily directed. He's most well known for 1954's The Cane Mutiny, but did over 50 other movies. Herbert Biberman, one of the only other directors, was best known for his plays and his films. He was also a member of the Directors Guild of America, which had the main purpose of organizing individual professions instead of having multiple occupations across the film landscape. He had been expelled from the Directors Guild of America in 1950, but later rejoined in 1997. John Howard Lawson was another very popular screenwriter and playwright. After his return from prison, he moved to Mexico where he wrote several books and a screenplay for 1951's Cry, The Beloved Country, under a pseudonym like Dalton Trumbo. His last screenplay was 1957's The Careless Years, which was also made under a pseudonym. Lester Cole was a founding member of the Screenwriters Guild. 
It was an organization that attempted to create criteria for contributions to any film made under the screen credits. Ring Lardner Jr. was the son of Ring Lardner Sr., who had his work admired by some of the greatest known American writers of all time, including F. Scott Fitzgerald, with a relationship that has often cited to have enriched American literature. Though Ring Lardner Sr. wasn't a part of the Hollywood Ten, his son, who was more focused in screenplay writing, was. Ring Lardner Jr. wrote over 30 films in his lifetime, and has received an Academy Award for his efforts. Samuel Ornitz, a scholar, novelist, and screenplay writer, helped to write the 1932 film Secrets of the French Police and the 1934 film One Exciting Adventure. All of these people combined helped establish what we know today as the Hollywood Ten. Though there was no shortage of people that were blacklisted during this time, these ten, over the hundreds of other popular actors, directors, writers, and producers, take recognition as the most influential of this time period and stand out in the case against McCarthyism. Every one of the Hollywood ten were sent to prison because of their acts. But why? Why wouldn't these well-respected, award-winning men just say they were not members of the Communist Party? Well, let's have them answer for us. These investigations are actually traps. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. It's a form of legal lynching. These men were only standing up for what they believed in. They were advocating for the freedom of expression and the right to deny something that they didn't believe in. If the Hollywood Ten never existed, who knows how the media landscape would look today. If their blacklistings were to have been left unopposed, the government may not have stopped there. But what happens if it goes beyond the film industry? Would our rights be held up in the same standards? This is what these men stood up for. They wouldn't let the government boss them around. Whether they were communist or not, that wasn't the point. In 1947, the Screen Actors Guild president, Ronald Reagan, even spoke out against the members who he believed to be a part of the Communist Party. He would later go on to become the 40th president of the United States. So let this be a message to anyone out there. Whether you have the future president advocating against you, or it feels like the entire world, just remember to stand up for what you believe in. And next time you see a communist spy trope in a movie or TV show, just remember why they were there to begin with. And with that said, thanks for watching. Hello everyone, my name is Luex. Thank you so much for watching Film History Digests. If you'd like to support the channel, instead of subscribing, pressing that bell, or liking the video, it would help us out a lot more if you could share the video on Twitter or Facebook. It helps get the channel seen by more people and is greatly appreciated. Subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future, so if you're interested, check out some videos I have on screen right now. If you liked the video or hated it, please let me know in the comments below. All feedback is appreciated more than you may know. And if you like my voice, you can find my channel in the link in the description below.